Good morning. You're very welcome along to Ireland AM on Virgin Media One. It is lovely to have you with us. It's Wednesday the 13th of March. Uh, coming up very shortly, we're going to be remembering the much loved and incredibly talented journalist Charlie Bird, who sadly passed away yesterday after a long battle with a motor and your own disease. We're going to be looking back at his life and legacy. That's at 7.15. And looking forward to later on in the show, we're also going to be getting an insight into the world of crime fiction with best-selling author, creator of the Detective Maeve Kerrigan series, Jane Casey, will be with us at 9.20. And if you follow Byrne on social I media... I never shut up about her. She's very excited. Yes, I am. Uh, also at 8.15, our resident GP will be here to answer your health-related questions. So whether you have a persistent cough or a peculiar rash... Is that yours, is it? Uh, <laughs> send us in your messages, maybe not pictures. Oh, wait, Nine six triple one triple one. But we would love to hear from you. So do send them into Akiva. Akiva is amazing. So get those questions in. Yes, not pictures or maybe pictures. Alan, good morning. Maybe pictures. Tommy, I have a cream for your rash. Don't worry. <laughs> the grand. Now in the kitchen this morning, ahead of St Patrick's Day, we have a dish for the dubs. Yes, Gina Daly is going to make us a coddle. Do you like a coddle? Let us know. What do you put into your coddle? We'd love to hear from you. Plus, we're bringing a touch of class to the catwalk with some Hollywood-inspired looks. Now. Derek is in the county that brought us our Roscoe winner, Killian Murphy. How's it going, Derek? <laughs> yes, Al Cork won the rest of the country. Neil, welcome down to the Rebel County, as they say, down this neck of the woods. And in fact, we're kicking off with that status orange rainfall warning for Cork and Kerry. Status yellow for County Waterford. Some uh, strong onshore winds, high tides, and coastal flooding and inevitability out there today. So we'll get into that later on. But as you mentioned there, Al, Cove and County Cork is where we're at this morning. Gwales Colony Arts, they're just out the road here. So coming up later on, we're off to visit them to time with uh, Shocks and a Gwale Cat. And we're also going to be opening up their brand new library. But check out, guys, beautiful thing, Coleman's Cathedral, just over our shoulder, and the iconic uh, deck of cards that Roa houses. Uh, good morning from Cork, bye. It's time now to take a look at this morning's paper, starting with the Irish Times. It's headline, Residents sought €50,000 to withdraw objection. A local resident sought payment for consultancy, in quotes, fees from a developer in exchange for withdrawing a planning objection to the expansion of a new apartment development. And this was in South Dublin. HSE data of a million people open to hackers. That's the front page of the Irish Independent. The HSE suffered an IT glitch in December 2021 that weakened security around the vaccination details of more than one million people. The examiner's front page, abuser expected jail in 1987. Convicted paedophile Bill Keneally has said he had no contact with Gardaí for 25 years, admitting to two Waterford officers that he had been abusing boys and restraining them with handcuffs. Pressure now on Lisa, Lisa Chambers to resign over a vote. That's the top story on the Daily Mail. Fianna Fáil Senator Lisa Chambers advocated to take the word mother out of the Constitution last year, despite this week saying that she could never vote to do so. The Herald's front page, Blue Steel, a Dublin-based guard that has appeared in court charged with burglaring a flat and perverting the court of justice. Course of justice guard, the Mark Duffy, was charged following an anti-corruption investigation. The sun leads with farewell, Charlie, your light shines on. Beloved journalist Charlie Bird will leave a lasting legacy that will not be forgotten after his death, said President Michael D. Higgins, who led heartfelt tributes to the RTE legend. The stars from page our hero. Grieving Stardust families have led the tributes to former RTE news reporter Charlie Bird following his death. In a nod to the campaigner, they said he was our hero. And finally, the mirror also goes with he this headline, Charlie was our hero. Stardust families led tributes to Charlie Bird yesterday after his death from motor neuron disease. And after the break, we will be paying tribute to Charlie Bird. Yes, we're going to be remembering him with a Stardust campaigner and broadcaster and friend, Joe Duffy. Welcome back. Now, yesterday we heard about the extremely sad passing of journalist and, of course, legendary broadcaster Charlie Bird. Yeah, before we speak about Charlie's life and legacy, let's look at his last appearance on our show back in September when he shared how he would like to be remembered. So how do I want to be remembered? Well, firstly, from my career in journalism and now from my honest campaign for all of us to extend the hand of friendship to everyone in dark places. 
I do believe I have struck a chord, and as I have said earlier, while I am alive, I want to continue working for that goal. Please, please look at me and extend the hand of friendship. Gorgeous words there joining us. Uh, to remember Charlie is fellow broadcaster Joe Duffy. We've also got Starduster campaigner Morris McHugh and Jack Horgan Jones from the Irish Times. Thank you all so much for being here. And Joe, um, first of all, our deepest condolences on the passing of your dear friend. And yesterday there was a beautiful tribute uh, on your show on Liveline. Um, how are you doing? And that outpouring of feeling was wonderful, wasn't it? It's incredible. Obviously people knew uh, the end was uh, near for Charlie. I thought it was uh, a bit longer because I you know he'd gone into the hospice on last Thursday and we put a wonderful, wonderful uh, building overlooking the sea uh, near Britain's in Wicklow. And uh, I knew on Sunday that things were very difficult, but I didn't know uh, that Charlie was going to pass uh, on Monday, obviously. And then the outpouring has been uh, even greater than people um, predicted because um, the impact he's had, especially in the last three years. But again, he's been in our lives. He's been the, the running order of our lives for the last four decades in terms of news, in terms of um, the daily of it. No matter what part of the world that the news was in, we almost waited until Charlie got there, until the Irish people took it seriously. And we go back to Sri Lanka, Rwanda, Syria, South Africa, Haiti, back in the news again, tragically. Um, and it was Charlie's presence, and he was uniquely Irish. I think he was a uniquely Irish uh, broadcaster in the sense that he had this connection with people. And I don't think, uh, Tommy and Bernard, I don't think there's any other uh, reporter that would stand in front of the, the National Parliament uh, waiting to interview the, the Prime Minister, the Taoiseach, and that the crowd would break into a chant there's only one Charlie board. It was so typically, <laughs> typically Irish, and it was so typically typically Charlie. He loved everybody. He liked being loved, which is a, an incredible gift, but he did love everybody. And he demonstrated that in the last uh, few years, especially, I think, over his career and over the, uh, the his dying. But he put so much life into his dying. I think he not only changed Ireland for good, but he changed us all for the better. You're no doubt about it. And as he just saw in that clip, just even when he was so sick about reaching out the hand of friendship as well. He was a great friend of yours. He's Can you give us some of your, like some of your fondest memories with him? Well, you see, the, the, he was a great friend with a lot of people, but my, my uh, most outstanding memory with Charlie is uh, three years ago, it's June uh, 2021. On June the 8th, Charlie was on by time and he was talking about this story, which he'd broken about the fact that a night he'd broken it in the Irish Times, actually. That the uh, that in 1979, a group of ne'er do wells who he knew, uh, he knew, he now knows, uh, had had to blackmail the Irish government with the uh, with the line that if you don't give us five million pounds, as it was in those days, if you don't give us five million pounds, we would introduce foot and mouth disease into this country. Now imagine the panic. That story stayed under wraps for uh, nearly 40 years until Charlie, with the help of the ex guard William McGee, broke the story. Charlie came on live line and spoke about that story and nothing, there was no other issue. There was no other advice. It was a little bit hard, but I, I didn't take any heed because the story, so as per usual with Charlie, so mesmeric and he was a brilliant storyteller. And I rang him the following, uh, the following Saturday, which is what, the 12th and 13th of June. And I said, Charlie, thanks for that. Uh, it was a great reaction, etc. And he said, I'm just coming out of the doctor's surgery in Ashford. And I said, yeah, I'd have a routine check. But he said, I've been having trouble with my voice. I went to my GP a couple of weeks ago. He sent me for a brain scan. I've gone in. He said, the results of the brain scan are fine, but he wants me to have another brain scan. And he says to me, I'm in trouble. Yeah. And he said, I need to go and see a uh, uh, consultant, a neurologist. And uh, that's the first. That was June 21. And then in October of uh, that year, he formally announced that. Yeah. Unfortunately, it was diagnosed as MNP. So I never forget that phone call. I never forget where it was. I was driving to Wexford myself. I went, uh, diverted into Ashford to have a cup of coffee with him. And I never, uh, I never forget that, that particular moment. Yeah. But we used to say in, in our job, Tommy and Baron, we used to say when Charlie Ford was on, he was box office. He had that incredible gift of being a great reporter, a great storyteller, of being serious in his storytelling, but also able to connect 
with people yeah. uh, so so strongly. And all the stories, like I, I went down with him when he was on that trial, the libel trial, National, National Irish Bank, an incredible story that himself and uh, the first big bank scandal, which yeah. was uh, the clerk and the things that come. And Charlie was, uh, in, he was in bits. He was really, really distressed. And, well, and you could see Charlie. that he got he got so invested in what he yeah. did, and even in campaigning for modern your own disease, like he just put everything into it. And, and from this, Morris, I want to come to you as well, because one of those things was, of course, the Stardust fire. And, yeah. and listen, this was something where you and your wife, Phyllis, sadly lost your daughter, Caroline. That's right. But Charlie, he was first on the scene there. But what was it? How did he help you and the other families? Well, in, in 1981, Charlie uh, arrived at the Stardust. He, was, he got a phone call, as he told it. He said his own story was that he got a phone call to get your arse over to our town, there's a fire over there in the disco. He said he didn't even know where it was, but he headed off anyway and he eventually got there. He passed by the Morgan Store Street and you could see all the arms and the activity that was going on and eventually arrived at the, at the start of the site. And I think personally that he was traumatised by what went on there. Although he said, and he, and he did this broadcast from there about the horrendous uh, fire that went on in the place, I think he also saw what the fire brigade were doing at the time, they were taking the remains of the burnt bodies out and, and taking them from the end. And, and Charlie saw all this. And from that day in 1981, Charlie stood behind us in our campaign for truth and justice. And uh, no matter where we went, Charlie was behind us. When we got down in the dumps and think we weren't getting anywhere, we were fighting against uh, a government, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, ordinary people from the north side. But for some reason or other, uh, we, we were sort of um, a non-entity, if you like, from the north side because we're from the Coolock area like that. Like uh, Joe Dutchby, he was from Body Fermat, you know, and Body Fermat had a reputation as well uh, for all sorts of uh, unpopular behaviour and all yeah. that unsocial behaviour. But Charlie, no matter where we went, uh, Charlie was there behind us. He, uh, we, we got invited up to the up to Derry for the Bloody Sunday Trust, and Charlie drove all the way from Wicklow right up to Bunny, and he sat there, and he was very concerned about the families of the Stardust because he felt that we weren't going to get in time, we weren't going to beat the government. Mm. But we persevered, and with Charlie's help behind us, you know, he he was a staunch supporter. And uh, you've gotten to, a, a, to yeah, an inquiry now. It's currently it's going on. It's gone into the inquiry now, which has gone on now since last March. It's nearly it'll be a year now at the end of this month. So it's at the stage now at the inquest that the uh, coroner now has to make a submission to the jury, right? And then she send the jury off to deliberate yeah. and come back with a verdict. Um, what's what the verdict? There's four items or three items on the verdict. But the verdict can be a one is unlawful killing. The second one is uh, accidental depth. Uh, the third one is misadventure. And this, another one's the narrative. The, the area, and they're the four verdicts that they can come yeah. to. And around this, with, though, with Charlie, like, it touched him. Like, he covered so many incredible stories, but he knew each member's name. He was emotionally invested in this. And that must be special to have a spe yes. special piece in your heart that he oh. gave, kept giving you guys the platform to get to yeah. where you are. He, he, he did indeed. And he knew everybody by name, all of the families, mm. uh, involved, especially the, the committee. You, you would know all the committee. He was very fond of uh, Chrissy Keegan, yeah. who started up the Stardust Victims uh, yeah. Association. And mm. he's a supporter of very, very much, you know. And uh, he actually told Chrissy once said that uh, he was getting married again. She she, she couldn't believe it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but, to his lovely, uh, to yeah. his fabulous wife Claire, and of course Tiger was always here with him as well, and his yeah. gorgeous children. And Jack, I think you know, as someone who's in your profession, yes. Charlie Bird is is a legend of the game. I think there are so many things that we could talk about. One of them, I think, is I was just watching it again last night. That time that he was in the U.S. and David Drum mm. from Anglo was there, and yeah. he's. He's bending down, looking through the letterbox, going, David, why won't you talk to us? The people of Ireland want to talk to you. Yeah, he was yeah. tenacious he was in what he did. Doggers he? And, and all those words that I suppose he'd use to, to sum up a journalist, journalist, a, a hack's hack. I think that what he had above all things was, you know, that, that will to stay with the story. 
and to do perhaps the kind of unglamorous things, the shoe leather journalism, mm. to go up and do the door knock and shout yeah. through the letterbox at David Drum. And I think that what kind of brings all that together and what makes good journalists into great journalists is when they're fascinated by their work and by their stories. And where they become, you know, professionally impartial, but personally invested in a way that just holds their interest. And, you know, we see that with how he covered the start of story back yeah. in 1981 and stuck with it for 40 years. But we see it in, the, I think, the quality of his work across, you know, the whole body of his career. You know, you could you could go from from the stardust through the the NIB scandal in the 1990s. The yeah. fact that he was one of the, the primary interlocutors for for the provisional IRA during the uh, during the peace from process. 1993, between, from 1993, yeah. you know, and he was just synonymous with with breaking story after story. We heard Joe saying even even well into retirement, yeah, he was yeah. breaking stories in the Irish Times and then going on on live line to discuss them. Um, we spoke about David Drum, but he was also obviously the the, the DC correspondent for um, for for RTE. He covered the Indian Ocean tsunami, yeah. the earthquake in Haiti. So I mean, it's 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 an nothing. incredible it's an incredible list of scoops and stories that I think were born of both his professional approach, but also yeah. the, the the overlap and the way he also his, his had a way personal interest to touch the heart on the people as well. That you know, like Joe mentioned, the There's crowd. There was a word. love. Mm. There was a love of him, and he will leave an incredible legacy. And I think we all just send yeah. our condolences to we Claire, do. to the Jeez. tiger who was part, such a part of the family as well. Gorgeous, um, um, Orlanes as well, of course, uh, his children. And if anyone wants, there's an amazing uh, podcast on Stardust. It's done by The Journal and uh, Maris involved, involved, Charlie's involved. It's absolutely fantastic to let people know your story. And Maris, we hope to talk to you again soon um, when you feel like you've gotten the justice that you deserve. Uh, we'd like to thank you all for being here. Maris McHugh, Joe Duffy, thank you for joining much. us today. We know that you'll be ch chatting again about Charlie uh, a little bit later on. And our sincere condolences to you and all your colleagues in RT and Jack Horgan Jones is staying with us. Joining us now to go through this morning's papers is political correspondent for the Irish Times, Jack Corgan Jones. Hello, Jack. We're starting with the front of your paper, the yes. Irish Times, and this is a planning objection. Please tell us more. Yeah, so really interesting story and an interesting dynamic that we've seen not only in this particular development, uh, an apartment development out in uh, the south side on Marion Road called Elm Park, but we've seen this kind of thing reported across the board over the last year or so. So. The, the, the story that we report this morning is that a, a resident nearby to the development sought a payment of 50,000 euros from the person who was looking to add an extra story on top of an yeah. existing uh, set of apartments. Why did he want the 50,000? What was his reasoning for the 50,000? Well, he, effectively, he was saying, look, you know, there's a, there's a couple of things, but I've been working on behalf of the Residents Association um, in their observations and objections to this, to this, uh, to this development. Yeah. And effectively, the, the, the quid pro quo as such was that, you know, if you, if you pay off, then uh, if you the, give me 50,000 euro, we're not I'll going to object. The object. Then, the, then the objection doesn't materialize. Mm. And this was in the first instance rejected by the developer. Yeah. But it seems as you go some way further down the road, there was some money paid across 20,000 euros. But even though the 20,000 euros went across, the objection landed in. So look, this is a very fraught and difficult area. That's receiving but he, he wanted then 100,000. He, he wanted 100,000 at one point, yeah, as well, because the, the negotiations kind of broke down. So the 50,000 went to 100,000, and then the 20,000 was paid over, and the other 80,000 didn't materialize, and then the, the planning objection did. But it's a, it's a fascinating area, because when you, the more you talk to people in, in and around the kind of world of property development, the more you realize that, or, you know, Ob objections or demands like this are not necessarily uncommon that it's a feature of the landscape you know wow. and that yes. and that you know what perhaps one of the one of the strengths of the planning system is that it is porous and people can become involved and it's good yeah. that people become involved but perhaps one of the weaknesses is that you know this is this doesn't seem to be in any way illegal per se no. you know it's so, not illegal so it's that's, not illegal, he's yeah. quite legal in his way to say to a developer you give me a hundred thousand euro and i will drop my objection that might stop yeah. you building an extra story on your apartment well, there yeah. were a couple of people who were living in 
was at Sligo and they were rejecting stuff all around the country. Well, this is it, yeah, and exactly. To come back to what I said about being very porous, you know, other jurisdictions might have a, a local distance limit on making an observation or, yes, or, or an yeah. objection. You know, whereas in Ireland, you can you can you can object no matter where you were. And they, I mean, the, the principle of paying money over is not necessarily a bad one. You know, you have things like wind farms going up, and there'd be local community organisations, the GAA, for yeah. example, or something yeah. like that, might get a new pitch, yeah. or people might get their uh, get the local roads tended to. Okay. Uh, so you know, there, there, there's a principle underpinning which is not necessarily a bad one, but obviously, you know, there is there is a limit to that. And the uh, the the developer mm. in this instance, even though they ended up paying over some money, they did in the first instance describe it. They as, didn't as go near hundred thousand. Yeah. But the person did say that this was for legitimate concerns on part of, of mm -hmm. the residents. Mm. Now let's move on to a story that is gaining more and more traction. So yesterday it was found that uh, Senator Lisa Chambers, who yeah. had campaigned for yes yes, had in fact voted no no, and now we've got um, Fine Gael senators who didn't even bother to vote. Yeah, it's a remarkable story, really. So one of the kind of outworkings of the, uh, the the stunning failure of the two referendums last week is that not only were the government not able to convince, convince the people. electorate, they yeah. weren't able to convince their own parliamentary Party. party. So <laughs> over the last couple of days, there's been these incredible stories coming out. First of all, Lisa Chambers, who is the government leader in the Shannon and campaigned on Grafton Street for a yes vote, saying that she voted no, no, having changed her mind in the last few days. And it was she only they, she only admitted to out canvassing when the picture of her was was shown. Exactly, out, yeah. out canvassing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So like she's she's on a bit of a sticky wicket there. Um, but you know, a lot of other politicians coming out of the woodwork and saying, you know, actually, in the in the round, I ended up voting no, yes, or or no, no. But the the, the two Fine Gael senators, I think, is 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 particularly damaging because it wasn't the case where they're claiming they had some Damascene conversion at the end and haven't read. But the she's saying general. that she changed her mind after reading the oh, Attorney no. General's advice. Yes, yes. But I suppose is... you could make a, a, a case for the defence for yes. you know people do have the, well, the right you, to exercise the franchise. Can, but can John you tell McGahan, us what happened to Fine Gael senators John McGann and Garrett Ahern? John McGann from Louth and, and and Garrett Ahern from Tipperary went to the rugby instead of instead of voting. So okay. They, 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 they so the they rugby match out. was on a Saturday. The rugby match was on Saturday afternoon. But could they not have Saturday voted on time. Friday morning? They could have, but the flight was booked well in advance. So that's that's the reason that was given. So <laughs> the I mean, polls were open at seven. The polls but were the open at seven. Flight was the, earlier. Flight, the flight seems to have been in around eight o'clock, so it would have to have been in the airport. But So it's kind of part of the job description to vote. It's kind of part of the job description to vote, and particularly for, for Gareth Hearn, who was who was pictured in a social media post, and social media will always get you these days, holding up one of those diamond pictures, yes, yes, and saying emphasizing oh. twice in the same sentence. And then the he didn't and then he didn't vote. vote. And then you don't go to vote. So it's um, not a good look. Yeah. It's not. It's, it's not. It's not a good look, and it's just it's one of the many look. uncomfortable kind of ways that this is playing out. Yeah, you know? it's not going well. Oh eight nine six triple one uh, triple one. I suppose you had one job is essentially it. Uh, Jack Horgan Jones, political correspondent for the Irish Times. Thank you so much thank you, for joining Jack. us this morning. Uh, lots more still to come on Ireland AM. See you in a few minutes. Now, there's so much division in society nowadays. It is important to remember what Ireland excels at best, selfless acts of generosity and, of course, charity. And the Irish Red Cross Humanitarian Awards aim to promote promote just that. Joining us is last year's winner of the Young Humanitarian of the Year Award, Ruby O'Kelly, and Secretary General of the Irish Red Cross, Deirdre Garvey. Good morning to you both. Thank Hello. you so morning, much morning. Uh, for morning. joining us. Can you tell us about this award, Deirdre? What is it and how do people get involved? Well, what we do uh, is to shine a light on inspiring people and groups and initiatives that really bring to the fore what's best about us humans and how we live with each other in society. So it's based on need, it's not based on a particular belief system, but it is going to inspiring people and organisations who have done something amazing in the last 12 to 18 months. So it's the Irish Red Cross Humanitarian Awards and we've been doing this for the last five years and uh, it's my uh, t pleasure to, uh, to be working here with Ruby who is our winner of the Young Humanitarian of the Year. We have six categories in total, five can be nominated by the public and I'm sure we'll get to that but the date is March 23rd <laughs> to get your nominations in if you want to 
Excel, and what sort of, like, what, who do you kind of nominate? How do you, like, is it just someone in your community that does great stuff and you're like, I think they should be recognised? Yes, we have uh, nominations for individuals and for community and humanitarian okay. groups yeah. and indeed journalists. Let me speak to the journalists out there who speak and showcase the humanitarian work because as we know, with so much media and it could be the social media media or regular media in terms of showcasing humanitarian work and we know that all we can do is showcase, it's the tip of the iceberg Mm -hmm. But what we want to do is celebrate and, and, and show through example that uh, it is possible to make a massive difference and people really appreciate yeah, it. It's, re it's amazing. It's mm -hmm. amazing awards as well and amazing for you, Ruby, as well, winning yeah. that humanitarian award last year. Yeah. Uh, you campaigned against bullying. Yeah. Why bullying? Why is that a topic that's close to your heart? Well, I suppose I've always been doing whatever I can from a young age, but when I was 12, I wrote that song called You Won't Stop Me because bullying was quite a close thing to home. I mean, <clears throat> I was quite young at the time, but even though I was young, I noticed how it impacted our family entirely from the perspective of my brother who was bullied and also my parents and how it was all these emotions and they say that like the young mind can absorb so many things and I was just absorbing it all and it was so intense and, and no one should be able to, no one should go through that kind of thing. And so from there, I just said, you know what, if I can try to make a change in any way I can, I'll do my best. And so with that song, I brought it around to all sorts of places, to schools. I did um, talks with people. I was on the radio. I was on Dahi and Mora actually with that song and whenever I can I just try to do my best. Shout out to Dahi and Mora. How are you? We had John here as well. <laughs> I don't like Dahi and Mora. Um, but listen it, and it's amazing getting that message out because bullying yeah. is something that it, we're seeing like we just said that there is so much division in society and we must remember mm -hmm. about yeah. what it is to be Irish and that mm -hmm. community and being close and nice to each other. Yeah. Like even during Covid you're amazing like you hosted like concerts for people who are cut off from community. Yeah. So you have that spirit inside you. Yeah. Has this award, has it boosted it or has it, do you think, encouraged more people, more of your friends to do similar things? I suppose it's good in all ways that I mean, like, you know, I worked as hard as I could during COVID. I mean, my uncle has disability and um, he was isolated from the world because of, pand because of the pandemic. I mean, the likes of me or you could go out with a mask on, but if he got sick, we could be back yeah. in like two weeks. But he, if he, he was vulnerable. And so I took them people who are vulnerable, like elderly people with disabilities, and I just gave them the connection and the conversation they needed at that time in their lives. And winning this award, I mean, it means a lot to me because I don't do it for attention. I don't do it for recognition. I do it because it's just the way I am. But well, it's a lovely thing to do to inspire, you know, young people. We know we've got TY programs yeah. kind of mm -hmm. realising what's going on around the world. But Deirdre, I think we have to talk about what is going on around the world and the work that the Red Cross does mm. because the Red Crescent are doing, mm. trying to do so much in Gaza at the moment. And I'm sure that you're involved uh, with efforts there. Yes. Uh, how is the situation going? Because we know that aid isn't getting in. Yeah. There, I mean, it, it's an unmitigated disaster, it, it is the truth of the matter, uh, in terms of over 12,000 children killed, to over 30,000 people and killed we say in those the 12, area 000, of Gaza. Those 12,000 children in Gaza that have been mm -hmm. killed mm -hmm. since October the 7th, that's more than the number that have been killed in the last three or four years in conflicts around in the world. In all of the conflicts around the world. I mean, it's a, it's a devastating. We, we haven't seen, humanity hasn't seen, I guess, the intensity and the scale uh, of the destruction that's happening in Gaza. And from the perspective of the Irish Red Cross and specifically the Palestinian Red Crescent and the Egyptian Red Crescent and the International Red Cross Red Crescent movement, we are an organisation and a network globally of humanitarians. So our work there never ceases in terms of dispensing humanitarian aid, providing shelter. Unfortunately, the, the fuel for providing electricity in hospitals, the food, the water, um, there is a trickle of aid getting through the crossing from in, in Rafa. But uh, not only is there a very intense, uh, I guess, uh, a gatekeeper function at that border where only a trickle of aid is getting through, just over 100 trucks of supplies versus up to 500 per day. So the comparison in terms of what's needed to keep that population alive. Um, and then once it's across the border, the conflict 
is actually preventing the distribution of the aid around the area. So what they're we getting need, swamped. Like so we, we need our three things. We need the, the, the fighting to stop. We need more aid getting through the border and we need fuel and we need the permanent, I guess, cessation so that we can rebuild collectively those humanitarian organisations and people in Gaza and around Gaza that want to help. And just to say the Irish people have been incredibly generous to the Irish Red Cross. Over a million euro has been raised in our Gaza appeal and it's still open oh. because we know, we know when this ends, there will be years and decades of yeah. rebuilding in that area. I mean, that's what we just said at the top mm. is Ireland is known for its acts of generosity mm -hmm. as well. And I know you do have colleagues within Palestine over there as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. uh, a de desperate, desperate mm -hmm. situation. But can, can we talk a little bit about Ruby as well and th these awards that are coming up? because there's so much going on here as well and it's yes. about rewarding that. So if people do want to nominate for the awards, it's going on to the IRC Humanitarian Awards. I. What areas can you award, yes. uh, nominate people? I'm delighted to talk about this because what's really important about awards like this, bad things and awful things, avoidable things are happening in Ireland as well as around the world. Yeah. But those of us who are making a difference and those of the, the public who are making a difference are encouraged. We need to nurture this. And if you go on to www.irchumanitarianawards.ie, you'll see six categories of awards. Now, one of them is the Lifetime Achievement. That's for the Irish Red Cross to bestow. Yeah. And we'll tell you more about that another time. But there's five open categories. There's Humanitarian of the Year, Young Humanitarian of the Year. We have Humanitarian Organisation of the Year. Think Community Group. Yeah. We all also have corporate impact and I think it's really really right. important there's an increasing number of corner, corporate yeah. partnerships and then the last one is the journalist of the yeah, year sure. that reports Fantastic. on humanitarian so issues. So that is all on IRC Humanitarian Awards .ie. Deirdre Garvey Secretary General for the Irish Red Cross and Ruby O'Kelly uh, the Irish Red Cross Young Humanitarian Award winner in 2023. Thank you both guys, so much. Thank you really. very much. Thank, thank you guys. Get out Thanks there so much. And nominate somebody in your community. Lots more still to come here on Ireland AM. Such a minute. You're very welcome back now from the male version of the menopause to why sniffing beer could be good for your health. Believe me, it's true. There's plenty of health stories making the headlines. Don't this believe week. us. Believe, believe the, the actual doctor. medical professional yeah. that we have. Joining us to go through them is GP and women's health specialist, Dr. Kiva Hartley. Good morning, Good Kiva. Morning. It's lovely to have you here. But first, we are going to talk about a story that's in a lot of the headlines today. And this is about the measles again. You spoke about this last time you were here. And this is um, a suspected case on a, on a flight from Abu Dhabi to Dublin. So what should people be looking out for? Yeah, so I think important to know what the signs and symptoms are. Yeah. So you develop symptoms usually about 10 to 14 days after being exposed to measles. Typically cold-like or flu-like symptoms initially, so fever, the usual thing, cough, cold, runny nose, sneezing, sore eyes, that kind of thing. And then the rash would typically develop about three or four days after the onset of those symptoms. The rash usually starts on your head or neck and then spreads outward to the rest of the body. So if you're concerned, if you have symptoms, if you think you're at risk, if you haven't been vaccinated, for example, these are reasons to maybe at least have a discussion with your GP. So anybody who's on that flight has been advised to contact the HSC. But if you weren't on that flight and you're in general, um, I mean, who's at risk of getting measles? Well, like, is, it, is, is everybody yeah. at risk of getting measles and severely getting them? Well, everyone is at risk of, of contracting measles, absolutely. Even if you're vaccinated, there's still a oh, risk. Oh, really? But it's a much lower risk. All right. And you're much less likely to get as sick. So it's the people who are not up to date with their vaccinations and people who maybe have um, a condition or medication that makes their immune system not function as well. Right. Mm. The elderly, the very young, you know, the typical things that we would have talked about, similar to COVID. COVID like happened, yeah. okay. Now, did you ever think you'd be on the telly discussing uh, Robbie Williams and his menopause? Uh, Kiva. I think I've peaked. You've peaked, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so Robbie Williams thinks he's going through the menopause. What is the menopause? Because it's a thing. So, so it's a departure for me because I'm. It's women's health. Women's health. my love and my passion. So it's. But it's. It's interesting, and it makes sense. You know, we all get older. We age. We change. Our hormones change. So andropause, which is the technical term. Um, so not menopause. So menopause is the is women's women. version, exactly. andropause is the male version. Exactly, yeah. And men do suffer from this, we have to say that. Absolutely, yes. yeah. Now it's really different. With women, we lose our ovarian function around the age of 50, 51. It's a much more abrupt loss of hormones. 
but andropause really describes the more gradual age-dependent decline in testosterone levels for men. So they would lose testosterone at a rate of about 1% of their testosterone level per year from 40. And for some men, I suppose they lose testosterone to a point that they become symptomatic and they suffer with this loss of testosterone or they could be considered testosterone deficient. And what does that mean? What, what could that lead to? So I suppose like anything and the same with menopause, it's really individual and some men won't have an issue and other men will and it will vary from person to person. Typically you can see um, psychological changes. So you can see depression, low energy, low mood, um, a loss of confidence. There's musculoskeletal impact. So things like a loss of lean muscle mass or strength, even osteoporosis, bone density loss. Um, there's metabolic changes. It increases the risk of insulin resistance and type two diabetes. But the most common symptom that men will report is sexual dysfunction. Right. So typically this is erectile dysfunction, a loss of libido and a loss of early morning erections. And is there any treatments for it? Yes. So if you're someone who is living with obesity, any um, treatment for that obesity can help raise testosterone levels. It doesn't matter if it's nutritional behavioral changes, if it's surgery, if it's the medications that we know are so helpful for weight. Um, all of this will lead to an increase in testosterone. And then we have testosterone replacement therapy, a bit like HRT. So I was just about to say, HRT, there is a version of for, testosterone, for TRT. T or T, that's it. Yeah, Genuinely. like a patch or a gel, or yeah, it comes in two forms in Ireland. So there's um, there's one that is a gel, so it's through your skin, and then the other form is intramuscular. It's an injection. So if so, men are feeling, if they are over forty and suddenly are feeling low, or it maybe could it, it could be this then, and yeah. just go go to your GP. Yeah, you're saying if you can get an appointment with your yeah. GP and and discuss this with them. With yeah, I mean, there's her. loads of other. You know, it's important you have blood work that you yeah. look at other causes. Yes. It's not the yeah. only cause of depression exactly. or erectile dysfunction. We look at cardiovascular causes. We look at your thyroid, etc. But there is growing evidence around testosterone replacement therapy and its benefits for yeah. long-term health and sexual function. Now okay. we like being on the world stage and we like being the best at things, and it turns. Ireland's the best at having gonorrhea in Europe. Um, mm. What's going on here, Kiva? And yeah. many STIs oh, mm. as well. We are we're top of the league. Yeah, some not of something them, yeah. to be no. proud of, I guess. But so this is based on 2022 figures showing that Ireland had the highest rate of gonorrhea in Europe. They did leave it. They left out England because they're not in the EU, just to mention that. <laughs> so, but we had the highest rates in Europe, absolutely. So we had about 3,800 cases of gonorrhea in 2022, which was a rise of about 50% from the previous So uh, jump of 50%. Uh, we have to, wow. uh, a lot of this is men having sex with men. Mm. Do you think this is a rise in the use of PrEP so people are now getting, are having unprotected sex? I think that's really controversial. I think it's probably multifactorial. We see it across the board, actually, um, and not in just one particular group, even across different age groups. Yeah. So, no, this is affecting everyone. Mm. Absolutely. And something everyone should be aware of. And what are the signs? So gonorrhea is a sexually transmitted infection. It's bacterial um, and it is... Um, asymptomatic, so it will not cause symptoms in at least half of women infected with gonorrhea. So about 50% oh. of women or more will not have symptoms. And it's really important because there's long-term health implications for that. So not everybody with gonorrhea will go on to develop complications, but it can affect your, so it can give you pelvic inflammatory disease which is inflammation where the infection is tracked upwards in the genital tract, and that can lead to infertility. And what are the signs in men? So when we, if we, so women, if they, if they have symptoms, oh, right. they'll have some vaginal discharge, they'll have pelvic or abdominal pain, they can have um, painful sex, they might get bleeding in between their periods or heavy periods. Yeah. Men are much more likely to be symptomatic. So the majority of men, I'm <laughs> pointing, yeah, pointing to, you know, to yeah. me now, yeah. But, but men in general are much more likely to be symptomatic. So men will have discharge from the tip of the penis. Right. That's about 80% of men with gonorrhea. Or they might have pain with urination. When you say discharge, in what, what way are you talking? What kind of a discharge? So, so discharge that either has a colour or right. it is, or it has an odour or something like okay. that. So something coming out of the tip of the penis that you... And don't, you don't don't expect to be have, there. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. And pain with urination or burning with urination, feeling like you need to pee a bit more mm -hmm. frequently, and even redness or soreness around the tip of the penis. Okay, so the best methods of prevention and treatment, obviously, if you think you've got any of these symptoms, please go and see your GP. Yes, yeah, so if you're symptomatic, definitely down to the GP and have a discussion. If you've had unprotected sex... And but is this not the thing, though? Is it because mm. you're getting this because you're not having unprotected sex? I think... I think condom use definitely is associated with reducing the yes. transmission. Yeah. Yeah. So it's anal, vaginal and oral. 
unprotected sex with an infected partner. That's how it gets transmitted. Mm, yeah. And condoms are the most sure way of preventing yeah, it. Of yeah, of course. Uh, now, the University of California, Riverside, this is something completely different, <laughs> has released a study stating that sniffing brewery Brewery? Brewery? Really brewery? Hard to What's say. it called? It, a brewery fumes okay, uh, could so... delay cancer <laughs> and Alzheimer's disease. Oh, look uh, at her face. Uh, look but at they're her face. saying it's, is it not what proven? Is, what is this? So this is, yeah, so this research in California, they took fruit flies and exposed them to this compound called diacetyl. Um, which I'd never heard of, so I had to go look it up last night. So <laughs> apparently this is a, um, it's a I think called a volatile compound, so it's like a gas, it's in the air. Yeah. And it's it's a byproduct of fermentation and brr, brr, ring, yeah. brewing, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's from yeast, apparently. Anyway, it ends up in the air, you inhale it, and what they noticed was that the fruit flies had a change in their genetics. So the gene expression in their antennae was changed. So the implication is maybe through some odors or things that cause odor, we might be able to affect genetic the gene mutation of us, yeah. And so long-term impact on health in a positive way. Maybe it's another way of delivering medication, that kind of thing. But they go on to say, but of course, diacetyl is really toxic. And so it's this really is dangerous. called diacetyl? Yeah. So this particular compound is really toxic if it's inhaled in higher... Like, so I don't think this is going... You, this you're not going out buying this no. now to inhale it and sniff it today. No, but I went no. down a rabbit hole of what volatile compounds are, and it's really interesting. <laughs> My favourite explanation is they're what dogs use to differentiate people. So oh, whoa! Like, yeah. Really? So yeah. when a dog is up smelling you? <laughs> Apparently, yeah. <laughs> Oh, sweet Lord. Good morning. Oh. Look at her. Look at her. She's one of our uh, preeminent uh, women's health experts. <laughs> I love what we make you do. Right, we've got some questions in. I have a corn <clears throat> on one of my toes. This is from one of our viewers. How can I get rid of it and how can I prevent getting more of them in the future? So corns are kind of thickened skin yeah, that happen yeah. where there's an area of friction repeatedly. So getting really good fitting shoes is probably the best thing to oh, do wow. initially. Okay. And then the pharmacy sell corn pads and things that will help separate yeah. your toes and ease the pressure in that particular part of your foot. Okay. okay. Uh, this is an interesting one. I took Sudafed after a flu and now I'm reliant on it for decongestion. Are there any side effects for long term use of Sudafed? I'm sure there are. Yeah, I think ideally you don't use a decongestant like that for more than seven days. I think that's what they say. So a week or less and then you're kind of done and you should do something else. You can become dependent on it. But them. if you, you are dependent on it now like this, what would you recommend? Uh, to talk to your GP and to slowly come off them and look at alternatives like the sinus rinses and that kind of thing. Um, and to look at why you still need it, I suppose, is there ongoing infection that needs to be treated. They can have an impact on blood pressure. Okay. On palpitations and that kind of thing. Long okay. Long. But, uh, please go to your yeah, please GP go to for your that. GP. You've got to see what's going on um, underneath that. As always, Dr. Cleva Hartley, a pleasure Keep to have you here. Thank, thank you, you very much. so much. And for really anyone who can say the word brewery, we are very proud of you. <laughs> brewery. Brewery. Oh, well done. He can brewery. do it. Okay. You're very welcome back. Now, in the lead up to St. Patrick's Day, we challenged our chefs to prepare some wholesome Irish classics. And I would argue that this... Uh, yeah, is it an Irish one? Is it a Dublin one? Gina Daly is here to prepare. Well, it's a controversial, it's a coddle. So is this traditional Dublin or do the rest of the country have it as well? well we We'd love to know. By you, you're horsing it into me. I'm horsing well. into me. <laughs> Grown up in Ballyfermot, coddle was always once a week we'd have coddle. So, uh, Always. what do you think? Is it uh, an Irish dish or just a, a Dublin dish? 0896 Anyway. And what do you put into your coddle? Because, Gina, you've your own recipe on it. Good yeah. morning. Good, Good morning. morning, guys. Hi. Um, well, for, for me, Dublin, uh, coddle is a Dublin coddle. And for the rest of the country, it's a stew, a white stew, as my mum would call it. A white stew. Um, okay, yeah. Now, so, with, with the coddle that I make, I do it with traditional, with sausages. Um, rashers or, or smoked bacon, which I have in the pan here. So I just have big, thick smoked lardons, kind of getting the, the juices going out of them there now. But I also brown some sausages. So typically you'd poach the sausage. So it's And that's what puts people off because it just <laughs> looks really white oh, and it's yeah. yeah. I mean, look at that. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. It's but like it a, tastes lovely. It's like a finger in my <laughs> stew. 
<laughs> but it tastes nice. Just close your eyes. Put okay. a blindfold on you. So um, um, with mine as well, I put a, a loin of ham in it, or you can put a ham hock or bacon ribs. And it's it, traditionally it would have been whatever you have left over in the house. Yeah, that was the idea the to throw it all in the pot. Bit of stock, but I also use a soup as well, just to thicken it up and give it a bit of extra flavour. So in my pan, all I do is I brown off the the bacon. Um, I'm not putting the loin in this one, but um, typically I just dump it in there, boil it all off. Yeah. Um, and it's just carrots, potatoes and onions. So, so simple and everything that you'd have in the press. So I roughly chop my onions. <clears throat> you can put it in whole and let it fall apart. So what would you have had in yours, Al, when you would have been grown up? It'd be like this, it'd be not lards of bacon, but just slices of bacon. Right. You know, like rashers. Rashers, right. yeah, like rashers. streaky bacon. Streaky all rashers, up. sausages, onions, carrots, potatoes, exactly what you're Does this bring there. you back to your childhood? Totally. You, I've never seen you so excited <laughs> about a dish. I, know, I, love I love a coddle. I'm actually delighted because it's the first time. I know you eat my food, Alan. <laughs> first, <laughs> first time, time. First time I've eaten your first food. Time I heard you go, Jesus, this is gorgeous. <laughs> <laughs> so there's someone recording this. But um, yeah, no, it's just, a, it's just a really tasty, simple dish. And then you can put baby potatoes or rooster potatoes or new potatoes, whatever you fancy. I use waxy ones so they don't fall apart. So hold on. So you have the bacon uh, kind of... Uh, so the bacon is just kind of browning off. off. It's releasing its flavours okay. just to get a bit of and then you're the adding the all pan. the veg. Just all the veg. And again, it's just, I mean, I usually do, I actually made that one in the slow cooker because okay. when I'm doing a big lump of ham, I want it to fall apart and yeah. be nice and soft. So when you're doing it on the hob, you'd boil it kind of for about two to three. Uh Hours. Yeah, oh, right. Be yeah, good just to let all the flavours yeah. and uh, on a low heat. With all that veg in it as well. With everything yeah. in it. And what you do then, I'll show you now. I, I'm not going to have time to put all the vegetables in, but I'll just. But give it, you it an is idea. about the stock as well, though, Gina, isn't it? And what you add into it. Exactly. So to get the flavour, so the, the vegetables are going to give you flavour. The mm. bacon's going to give you a lovely flavour. Mm. So I use a smoke and an unsmoked just to get that nice taste. And I just dump a stock pot in. So I'm all about. The I love the way you love that convenience. Just get a stock pot. Throw the water in. That's all going to break down anyway when it's boiled. And then what I use is a leek and potato soup packet. Ah, right. So okay. um, if I'm doing a big batch, so the one I did in the slow cooker would feed, I'd say about 35 people. <laughs> feed on my neighbours. <laughs> um, so I would use two packets of soup. And what you want to do is really just kind of cover the vegetables. Okay. Have it all in there. So a leek and potato soup. Leek and potato soup, or just potato soup, or you can use vegetable soup, whatever flavours yeah. you like yourself. Okay. And then when that's like that's literally it. Salt. You don't really need salt and like salt in it because the the ham is going to be salty enough. Yeah. Um. You can so, put in a bit of thyme if you want. Whatever so flavours. Have you put the sausages? Are there sausages in that? No, I didn't. Actually, the most oh. important part. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so when do they go in? So they, they all go in at the start. Oh, really, so you just they, yeah. lump everything just, in and just drop and them in. Leave yeah. it for two hours. Yeah, and that's it. You say the house smells gorgeous after that as well. Delicious. Now, I've kind of smelled all night, <laughs> even after a shower. <laughs> <laughs> I was reeking. <laughs> reeking okay. a coddle. Uh, onions. I was like, reeking a coddle. <laughs> I but, wonder um, why yeah. Adam is in such good form now when we come in. <laughs> So that's it, and then just fill it up over the top. Okay, so and if it kind of simmers down too much, you can just add a little bit of water and just keep it yeah, bubbling away. put a lid on it and it'll keep all the, the juices and the, the, right. the bits in. And, and, and literally that's it. Serve with a nice bit of bread and butter. Well, this is what, uh, this is growing up with me because we saw all some spread. The bread and, and, uh, and St. Patrick's Day bread. And some good butter, exactly. Yeah. Now, Dunk it in. But you see the way in this one, the finished one here, you have your brown sausages. So does that mean you've just fried them off so later or I at fried the start? Them, I fried them at the beginning. At when the I put beginning. Them, so you can see in this one here. So this has all your bits and pieces. So I, you can so see So you have the a ham. mixture in case someone who doesn't like the... Exactly. Like my kids... The anemic sausages. ...will die if they see them. Like me, me, ben will probably eat them and the baby would, but um, I won't. I okay. have to have the brown sausage. Do you? Yeah. It reminds me of someone... <laughs> What reminds you of something? <laughs> <laughs> we won't go there. <laughs> um, Bit no. small, really, no, isn't it? Oh, this is it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to say it. I said to Adam, I'm still going to say something inappropriate on the telly. <laughs> oh, you're happy with any of those sausages then, man. Let's not say. Uh, oh, it's not too fingers, calm. they were reminded of me. <laughs> anyway, so that's the coddle. A so that's coddle. the coddle. So, yeah. Happy uh, Paddy's Day, everybody. <laughs> no wonder you love it, Alan. <laughs> Uh, 
uh, Gina Daly Gina and Daly. Irish <laughs> slash Dublin classic <laughs> from the Daily Dish. Thank you so much. <laughs> now, up, save us. Up next, Eric is in Cork learning some Cooper Fuckle for Shark, Shark the Nagelga. We'll see in a few minutes. <laughs> Now this week on Ireland DM, we're escaping to a whole new world with Disney's Aladdin. The critically acclaimed Broadway and West End musical is going to hit its, uh, have its Irish premiere at the Borgosh Energy Theatre next week, and it's going to run until the 14th of April. So that's a perfect treat for the family this Easter break. Aladdin comes from the team that has brought us other beloved Disney productions such as Beauty and the Beast and The Lion King. We're giving you the chance to treat your bestie to an overnight stay in the five-star Anantara, the Marker uh, Dublin Hotel. VIP tickets to see Disney's Aladdin along with some exciting prizes. To be with the chance of winning, just tell us about a friend you have who is like no other and why they deserve to be celebrated. You can get in touch. It is Ireland AM Comp at virginmedia.ie. It's on the screen there right now. And the very best of luck to you. Yes. Now, a Shakhtan Nguelga continues. Derek, he is still, a, you saw his Kupla Fuckle. Kupla mm -hmm. and this morning he's checking out uh, the Kupla Fuckle in Cove. Derek, what are you up to? Yes, good morning, team. Forger Ash, good day. Grace Goldie Tommy Bjorn Shoy, Cove in Junta Corky, the home of the Oscar Donal. Dead right, we're all celebrating here in Cork this week. It's a great, a great week for Cork and a great week for Killian Murphy. We're very proud of his achievements. I mean, what a win, right? Unbelievable, unbelievable. Yeah, we're we're delighted. Absolutely, very very proud. Anyway, Donal or Dush Slave on Privida a Thogwin Modni Nio. Donal shot on the grill, get Thogwin. Shocked in the grill, because shocked in vour is a hit. Shots for school always. Uh, we always have a, a great celebration for shocked in the grill. It's, it's bigger this week than it has been for years, and and that's great. And it's great to share it with Ireland AM and all your viewers. So um, we've had a, a, a lot of events during the week. We yeah, tell off. us about some of the events. Uh, yeah, so we, we started off with a, a school uh, community Kaylee in the local GA club on the third of March, and that was very well attended. And it was uh, uh, Ivor the Gachain. It was brilliant, really, and it was a fun fundraiser and it was, everyone was very happy with it. Yesterday we had a lovely event in Cove Library um, with uh, the celebrated uh, Irish author Alan Titley. He was um, launching his uh, uh, book on, on Tawn Bo Coolinga, which the is the... brown bull of Coolinga. Exactly, yeah, well exactly. School, right? So we, we, we went down and he did a presentation and we were delighted with that and thanks to Cove Library and to Alan Titley for, for, for facilitating that event for us. We have other events. We have a community concert tonight here in Cove um, that we'll be participating in and we'll have... Um, There's a Bell there's there. a school bell now. Um, yeah, so we, we, we have many more events before Friday, actually. So we'll be kept going. We'll be kept to, to, to keep going here until Friday. And, um, well, right up to Patrick's Day, really. So it's, it's, it's fantastic. Shock on the Grail get prom promotes the Gaelge in the community and we appreciate what happens in the media as well um, this week and it gives it all validation for what we're doing here in school. I mean the Irish language it really is flourishing now right? It is and the Gael Scullina are becoming very popular, uh, a very popular choice for parents across the country and Ahas and Down or Ingeville Gael Scull Brown so Hugging So Cove and um, we're, we're delighted to be part of that. August Talarla Nua Agrin. Well Talarla Nua Agrin, Ta Shomra Le We have a spare uh, room here in the school and and um, like uh, coming out of COVID, the buzzword of the department was uh, wellness and well-being. And we set up a sensory room here in the school last year. And with the same momentum and the same personnel and the same cooperation, we, we've developed the uh, Laurelin School now as well. So it's a room where the classes come, come of a Friday afternoon or a, any afternoon to come down and have just a relaxing time sitting around in the bean bags, reading their library books and that. And August Toshi they live three barely August three quick. Well, our mask on the Laura going each other with a full mixture of books and they can choose and pick and choose as as they as they like. So I mean it really is a, a big community effort to get something like this up and running, right? Well it is and there's a lot of cooperation involved from the Rooney School Debbie there and the Compantas and Didish Mahori with the staff members and it's a it's a whole team effort and um, I think it's a it's, it's great that um, we have a, a, a platform to launch it on which is held here this morning. Yes, so absolutely. We're going to be cutting the ribbon a little bit Fantastic. later on. Don't now we're going to 
going to pop over here to Anu. Konstata to Anu. Tomegama. Now, kada hanin lat fui shot na gurga. Spralum shot na gurga. My being ready on special to shul to school. My hampla ta keli trane gesh kain tori agus trust na agus my shinde. Uh, do you think it's a good thing that Shacht na Gaelga is organised each and every year? Yeah, Shacht na Gaelga. It's a huge celebration of our language and culture. Um, it's also a big build-up to Lala Padraig um, and hopefully a big win in the rugby this weekend. Oh, absolutely, against Scotland, right? Yeah. <laughs> Go on, Ireland. And Nevin, I'm with the sauce good on Ireland, Oscar Der Skull. Ta man a sauce that ta she ga hoontuk u le spas er le gwing to skull that ta kyun kompordok agus irunuk dan el le horokt. August Kinnish Tottenham? Uh, Tom uh, Goblin de Gish. Goblin de Gish. August Robert and Shaw. Inishton Robert on will in sport to Emirates uh, a good free law her. Oh, Ta Yen and Muntar Deglan on sort sport, Lin Vila Unta Gwing Lesh on soccer, Kamorta soccer. I need a big soccer competition. Tell us about that. Oh, yeah, well, it was the five aside FEI schools competition. We won the first round, like the qualifying round, and now we're going to Virgin Media Park after Easter. So not only did you win the cup, and he also won an Oscar as well down here in Cork. Yeah. Really, Simon Kinnish. Oh, Thomas, you're hamely in the day. in the day, Deesh. So, I mean, Donald, it's so important that we have this facility here this morning, right? Yeah, it's fantastic. And um, as I say, it's, it's a great opportunity for the school to be able to share it with the nation this morning. And we, we're very grateful for that opportunity. Yeah. So, we might ask you, Derek, now to do the honours and to Garen Rabin doing it. Yeah, Garen Rabin. We're laying scissors down. Oh, toss scissors. Oh, Toshi Mofoka. Toshi on show, right? We have everyone around. Have we everyone here? Are we watching back? It's you to come in here, Donald. Okay, so a three. Ado, Augustin, hey, we got it. Absolutely fantastic, and a Brilliant. brand new library for the school and the local. Community. Absolutely, and it'll, it'll be well used, and it is a great uh, facility to have in the school. And um, as I say, thanks to everybody who cooperated with each other to to achieve this, and um, so we're delighted. All right, Carmela Mahagutun to all the Poshi and the Muntori. They're all hiding here. Look behind the door. They're everywhere. <laughs> anyway, Carmela Mahagutun, <laughs> back to you in studio for Cork. Slow. Oh, my God. Oh, the Muntori. Well Derek, done. Derek for the Oris one day. Oh, he's, he's amazing. So no better man to open but the library. Brilliant. Isn't it just lovely to see those young kids fluent so in yeah. their native They're language? So fluent in our native language. Yeah. 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 I'm yeah. raging I didn't learn it when I was in school. Yeah. <laughs> well, I tried There's to. There's plenty of time. <laughs> plenty. <laughs> You tried, you tried. Hey, well done to everybody Absolutely. down in Cove this morning. Amazing. And coming up in the next hour, considering we have just gone from a library, our next guest is very apt in the final hour acclaimed author, Jane Casey, tells us about her latest literary triumph. Uh, we're also going to be previewing all the latest movies and TV shows to hit your screens this weekend. Plus, we've timeless elegance fit for a movie star on the catwalk. We're back after this short break. Don't go anywhere. You're very welcome back now. We have one man who's very happy in the studio this morning. Uh, see, the old dub here and coddle. I know. We, Gina Daly was in the kitchen and she was making coddle earlier on and I love a coddle. So I was very happy, and happy this delicious. morning. We thought we'd ask people, or people, we thought we'd ask you if it's a Dublin dish or an Irish dish. And I think a lot of the texts are coming in and say it's very much a Dublin dish. Yeah, Porrick has said, bang smack in the middle of the Ireland and I've never heard of coddle. Never heard of it. It's slap bang in the middle of Yeah, well of he of said, bang, bang, doesn't matter. Bang smack is fine Bang smack us. is grand, Porrick. Porrick's never heard of a coddle now, yeah. Have. Uh, Michael says Donegal man coddle is definitely a Dublin dish. Uh, Bernie says coddle was always my mother's weekly dish. She's originally from Ballymun but now lives in Wexford. She's a mother to 11 of us and has 57 grandchildren and 12 great grandchildren. <laughs> Safe to say she's made a lot of coddle. Oh my Bernie. God, your man. Oh, I'm telling you. Well done. I'd love to see that picture with all the grandkids and the kids. That's 57 amazing. grandchildren. <laughs> Oh, oh here's goodness. Jennifer, lives in Monaghan. Yeah. Loves a coddle, definitely a Dublin. I live in Monaghan now and find most people outside Dublin are completely turned off by the look of it. It's delicious, though. I add some red lentils for a bit of extra flavour. And you were a bit turned off by oh, the... it's the white coddle. It's, it's the, the white boiled sausages. 
Oh. My mother, a Kerry Sorry, woman. Gina. My mother, a Kerry woman, texted and she was like, "Oh my god, just um, basically." Yeah. I think it's delicious. I think it's delicious. Well, let's food. have a look at a picture of one then. So Natasha said, "My mom's, uh, my mum's ca uh, coddle is." <gasps> oh, oh, see with look the look mash at that potato. There. Favorite dinner of all time. I love when she makes it. When you're having a bad day, it can solve anything. Uh, oh I god. think with the mashed potato, I might enjoy a bit more. <laughs> oh, I don't know. No. Yeah. Oh, with the old sausage, it's not. No, it needs to be browned off. The sausage. Says, uh... <laughs> it needs to be. I'm browned off by those <laughs> white sausages. Well, Katie says this. My nanny's from Donegal, but was taught to make coddle when she moved to Dublin. <sighs> but she makes a brown coddle. Now, see, that's a stew. If it's a brown coddle, it's a stew. And uh, none of us can eat the white coddle. People say that it's a stew, but I, I hate the white coddle. Yeah, we're not going to get into it anymore. There we go. There you go. I think we need to draw a line. Under the under coddle. Anyway, all of that. there was a bit of crack. And thank you for your text messages. Absolutely. And thank you to Gina Daly uh, for being absolutely brilliant and um, managing these two in the kitchen. <laughs> Up next, we're cancelled. delving into the <laughs> world of suspense and mystery with crime author Jane Casey. Yes, you don't want to miss it. Welcome back. Now, our next guest is an internationally best-selling author with a flair for tension, filled crime thrillers that leave readers on the edge of their seats. Well, one reader here, <laughs> uh, here to talk spicy scenes and seeing her work on TV screens is author Jane Casey. Good morning to you, Jane. Hi, good morning. Uh, listen, big, like it's a bit of a fangirling moment right here. <laughs> uh, congratulations on your new book. Um, internationally best-selling author, Am I right in saying, so you got a silver medal in your Leaving Cert English exam and actually Seamus Heaney presented to it to you. That is literally my claim to fame. Like, forget about anything else. That That's is, pretty amazing. It was pretty amazing, yeah. He was absolutely lovely. Oh, I meant getting the silver medal. Uh, well, that too. <laughs> no, but did you have, so meeting somebody like that, do you think that was a real inspiration for you going forward into what you've now done? I think it was. I mean, he was, he spoke to me as if I was like his equal, even though I was a little 18 year old who basically knew nothing. And he was so generous and so sweet. And um, it was a great start is what I would say. Yeah, because the pressure is kind of on from the start then when you're receiving an award from Seamus Heaney. Like, was it for you written in the stars like, this is what I want to do? Like you were going to Trinity and you were like, I want to write. It was definitely something I wanted to do, but it took me quite a while to kind of work out what I wanted to write and that it would be a crime novel um, which is weird because I always loved reading crime novels but it just took a little while for that kind of to percolate through. S uh, yep. Go on. Yeah, like, it's, can I talk to you about your writing then as well? Because um, your husband's a criminal barrister, is that right? That's right. And uh, I was reading there that Richard Osmond said that if you're going to ask um, someone on how to uh, murder someone, ask a crime writer, like, do you get, like, I can imagine the conversations around the dinner table when you're kind of looking for ideas for this book is uh, pretty dark. It gets very dark. <laughs> and actually, sometimes I kind of worry about my kids because I have a 12 year old and a 14 year old. <laughs> And their attitude to life is very different from their friends, I would say. And, um, you know, they know things that they like the street value of a kilo of cocaine. They can tell you that straight away <laughs> just what? because of, from around the dinner table, from hearing my husband talking about what he's prosecuting and what he's doing. Oh, so, wow. Yeah. Do we talk about murder? We yes. talk about <laughs> all kinds of things. <laughs> Cleared <laughs> restaurants before. Did they get involved in the conversation? The kids oh, yeah, they love it. Do they? They love it. They love it. Are you creating little murders and murderesses like it? God, I hope around not. the house. <laughs> this is quite the thing to be sort of percolating. But it's got to be interesting, right? Having this sort of going on in your house because when you start writing, you don't know that you're creating a series. Maybe in your head you're like, oh, these characters can go further, but you have to have that success with the reader, right? So when you this is you're in your eleventh book in the Maeve Kerrigan series, and you've got standalone books as well. So you must have loved the characters from the start, or or were you just hoping people would feel the same way? Because it's been so successful. I think I was hoping that people would, would like them the way that I did, but like you never know how something is going to be received and if it's going to be successful or not. So um, it's a huge surprise to me, honestly, to still be writing them and to get, like it's a huge privilege that people are excited to read them and wait for the next book to come out and send me messages asking what's going to happen and naming no names for it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I probably shouldn't say that you got a, an early copy and we heard this yeah. squeal across the office a couple of weeks ago and we didn't... <laughs> 
thought that it was. That was but funny. is that the new Maeve Kerrigan book? Yes, it was has Stranger been released. in the Family. In the because family. you have a, a, a big fan here, lots of big fans. Yeah. But what is it about, what is it with you more about Maeve Kerrigan that's kind of captured you? Because they're, they're tension filled, but you can kind of relate to these characters, but also there is a will they, won't they, there's a lot going on. Well, it's the will they, won't they, that you keep that's going on big, about. But that's a big thing, as well. that is a huge thing as well. But Shonda Rhimes has talked about her characters in, we'll say, Grey's Anatomy, and how when she's writing them, she feels like they're part of her family. That when someone, something bad happens to them, she's like, I get really upset. So is are you very close with the characters in these books? Oh yeah, very much so. And I feel really mean sometimes, like when I, when I put them through, awful things, but it has to happen sometimes, you know, yeah. you've, you've got to be cruel and um, they can cope. cope. <laughs> They're hard. So They're tell hard. us, tell what, us what is uh, the new A Stranger in the Family? What's it about? Well, it starts off with um, a husband and wife who are found dead. Um, it looks like a murder suicide, um, but actually there's a l little bit more going on there and their daughter had disappeared 16 years before. So they've had, they've been sort of at the eye of a media storm and then they're kind of hiding away. So the question is, what do they have to hide? And why would somebody want to kill them? And when you're doing all of these things, are you, as you're getting ready to write these books, are you picking up bits that you're seeing in the news? Because obviously you're dealing with the Met Police Force is, is the ones who are investigating here and, and Maeve's parents are Irish. But there's been a lot coming out about the Met and, you know, misogyny, inherent racism um, uh, and, and bad issues about them. Are these things that you all take in and, and you're like, OK, how do I explore that in my books? Or Fair. are you like, mine are different? Um, no, I think you have to kind of like you're writing about a world that exists. Yeah. Like it's not a fantasy. So they're kind of real people, but really good police officers going out and doing amazing jobs. And I kind of, there, there are bad police officers in the books and there are good police officers. But, um, you know, you have to reflect reality. Uh, well, reality, let's get into that because uh, there's meant to be one line in the book now that even makes you blush because these books, it's very much about uh, <laughs> the character Maeve and her boss. Give us the line. What is the line that makes I, you... I literally cannot say it. <laughs> like, I literally can't. And also, it's not Is that because it's morning British. television or because you'd be... I remember I added it in in the second when I was doing the edits because I was like, I have to put this in. But I was so embarrassed to write it. Do like, you know I, the line? Honestly, yes, I do. Oh, you know it the second you see it. Yeah, you yeah. know it the second you see it. It is get yourself a fan. Um, because <laughs> line, know, <laughs> you'll have to buy the book, like guys. You'll have to buy the book. So uh, marrying these two genres, you know, like if you were watching TV back in the day, it was like moonlighting, you know, when that was on the telly. How? Because people have gotten so into these characters. You're still doing the detective drama, but then there's also this sort of romance element. Did you know that that was going to happen? Yeah, that's what keeps me hooked. OK, um, OK. But like Josh, who's the, the kind of love interest that everybody's obsessed with, he's not in the first book in the series. So yeah. he kind of, he developed over time. He arrived and then swaggered in and never left. Never left. Mm -hmm. uh, can we ask about one of your standalone books, The Killing Kind? It was on television last year as well. I mean, congratulations on that. It's no doubt uh, it won't be long Fantastic before we book. see Maeve on the telly as well. An interesting bit I thought was Colin Morgan said that it was really important that they had an intimacy coach in it because it was difficult for men to admit intimate scenes are vulnerable. What, what's that about? I mean, I wasn't on set when they filmed it. Okay. But it was a very, um, there's a very intense relationship and he's like quite a questionable character in it. He's not like the hero, but he is, he has a relationship with the, the heroine. So it was, I think it was quite difficult for them to do it. And I, I think like I went on set and I was watching them do a very ordinary scene yeah. and they were walking down a flight of stairs and I was like, I couldn't do that if it was me. I literally couldn't do that, walk down a flight of stairs with everyone watching and get that kind of attention. Never mind the intimate Never scenes. Never mind a sex scene, you know? And how do you see control? Because, you know, The Killing Kind was yours and you handed it over and Disney Disney create this. And of course, all the fans are hoping someday that we see uh, Maeve on screen, Maeve and Josh on screen. I is it hard to give up that control? It is. It was easier with The Killing Kind because it was a standalone. Yeah. But I'm still writing this series. So th these characters belong to me. They you know? do. And it has been announced that Maeve is going to come to Ireland for a book in the future. That's right. Yeah. Now, is the pressure on there from your family, your parents? Oh, what are you going to do? Where are you going to write about? 
I mean, it's, it is stressful writing about Ireland because I think people will be much more um, critical or like they'll want to make sure that I get it right. But I always try and get it right. Well, if it was going to come to Ireland and it was coming onto our television screens, who do you think would play Josh? Oh, I who, mean. Who would you like to see play Josh? I have many opinions on who should play Josh. It's none of them, not, not my business. Who do you well, want to see? I always just say it's whoever you fancy most. <laughs> that should, that's the ideal Josh for my you. My partner. There we go. He shall be playing Josh. Who? That's a safe answer. My oh, fella. Oh, your fella. Yes, OK. <laughs> very good. That's uh, a safe answer. The housemate. Um, there's, a, there's a big murderess writer community in Ireland, like yourself, Liz Nugent. There's so many. Amanda Cassidy was here yesterday. Y you all have a WhatsApp group and you all meet up and everything. Yeah, we That's got to be really supportive. It's lovely. I mean, you'd think that we were all competing with one another, but we're not. Like, we're very supportive of one another. And because crime readers read a lot. So if they like my books, they might like Amanda's, they might like Andrea Mara, they might like Liz Nugent. Like, we're all just sharing the joy in what we do. What an amazing Lovely. time for Irish writers as well. It is just incredible. Uh, Jane Casey, congratulations. Great to have you in. Thank you very much. I know you two are going to be joining up later on with the launch of A Stranger in the Family. It's out tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jane. Cheers. Uh, lots more still to come. Our movie maestro, Brian Lloyd, is back to dish, uh, the, dish the dirt on the latest TV and film. Uh, plus on the catwalk, it's all about Hollywood glamour. We'll talk to you shortly on Ireland AM. Hold on. Welcome back with award season wrapping up. We've had the stars of the screen step out in stylish looks. So when they're done, we've, we'll, we do do it after. Yeah. we'll do it after. Joining us now to show off the very best of some Hollywood glamorous stylist, Mandy Marr, and winner of Goss Stylist of oh, the Year. Thank there you. we go. Look Thanks at her. Thanks so much. I'm still buzzing. Oh, Can't believe it. But anyway, we're delighted. Well deserved. Thank you very much. Well Thank you. Fabulous looks Thank all you. the time. Yeah, well done. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Now we're going to get straight to the fashion. Our first look we've got, uh, Regina King is our, the actress who was inspiring our first look today. That's right. With now what it, she's wearing well, it's actually here. more with the colours what was yeah, inspiring beautiful. on this because it's quite a structured dress, but also the fact that it's orange. Okay. So I've brought something for everybody today. And what I'm loving about the first dress yeah, that we oh, actually, is this beautiful. Oh. This is, this is stunning. Be wearing this, no problem. Absolutely. It's from LRK um, Dress Hire. So not everybody wants to purchase a dress. So you have the option of hiring out a designer dress and being able to hand it back again when you're finished. Because you know the way sometimes you only wear these oh, dresses listen, once. Or dresses something all like the time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that's what's fantastic about who's something the like this. On the dress? It's actually Solace London. That's what it so, is. It yeah. looks like a Solace and we, London. We know fabulous. Solace London is yeah. absolutely beautiful. But I'm loving this because it really is a wow dress. It's very structured piece. And of course, what about those sleeves for the big effect? Beautiful. And we're talking about red tie, but obviously there's Debs, there's wedding, there may be formal weddings and stuff coming up. Absolutely. And and there is, Ellen, and there's people that would wear a dress like this to a wedding. Absolutely. Of course, yeah. And of course, we have a lot of balls coming up and black tie events. But I love it. This is a real statement piece and it, it's just it just ticks all the boxes. It's absolutely stunning. Mm. And because it is such a knockout mm -hmm. colour, you've gone with kind of understated, but very of the moment pearl. Absolutely. Uh, earrings. And I'm loving these. This is from Janie Mack Designs, an Irish um, designer, jewellery designer, Martina Tully. And I'm loving these because they're freshwater pearl. But she actually hand crocheted these as well. Aren't they beautiful? What do you mean in, hand in, she them? actually hand crocheted the little centrepiece in wire. Oh, wow. This is a very clever little piece. I'm loving it. And again, like that, we, as you said, we're in, it's keeping it simple because yes. sometimes with accessories either makes or breaks an outfit but you wouldn't some... wear a neck piece or anything not at all it's, it's all it's, it's just there it's just yeah. all about this as we said alicia's just flying away today with something yeah. like you this it's lovely it. alicia and Janie mack what a great name yeah for a company. absolutely our and second look is hey. emma stone i think we can have a look at uh, yes. now as inspired oh this is her Oscar's and this is, dress. and to me this was one a winning dress i loved this i absolutely loved it but again it's the mint green and we're seeing a huge amount of mint green coming through for this season as well for for spring summer and this version is what we have today. It's from dresses.ie. So this is only nine, nine, 100 euros? Yes, it's an incredible it's price point. It, it's yeah. absolutely wow. beautiful. It's sequins, it's sparkle, it has that little one shoulder um, details we can see here with the satin overlay and again with that cape drop. So it, it does exactly as you walk into a room, it's a real uh, um, talking piece as well. Yeah, it moves yeah. really well with Katie as well. Like it is, I, I really it's like the solid. fashion. It's yeah. stunning, it's solid, isn't it? Yeah. And, and a few uh, points to keep in mind when you're buying a dress like this you need to be able to sit 
property because people often don't take things yeah. like that into consideration. We were talking about that, like people at the Oscars. They're going in like this and then they go, oh God, I have to mm. sit down yeah, for three hours. Absolutely ridiculous. And, like this. <laughs> and, and you can see it on their facial yeah. expressions. Yeah. So you need to be comfortable to be able to sit, to be able to move and like that, that it's easy to actually walk in as well. And does it come in various sizes? It, it does. This comes from sizes 8 up to 16. Brilliant. And I love the earrings with it then, the drop yeah, pearl. Yeah, I went for it and this is Fezzi Maisie, which is a, an online company as well, which is simple and double and um, pearl drop and um, earring. But again, keeping it quite simple. I kept the jewellery very minimal this, this morning. This is stylist of the year, Mandy Mara. Oh, that is very much together. Really yeah, it's gorgeous. gorgeous. Yeah. It's beautiful, isn't it? Thank I'm you. Thank you. Well. The price of that. It's beautiful. Very good. Our next uh, look is Jen today. And we're um, staying with dresses.ie. Oh, lovely. Oh, wow. Yeah, this is again, you know, something with ball gown. So you're either into me. something very structured and very fitted, or do you want to make something with more of a ball gown, which is actually what we're seeing here with something like this. Again, it's full of sparkle, loving it, and they have them in a few colours as well. This oh, is 89. Right. Yes, yeah. Wow. So it's, as I said, it's all very reasonably priced, and it really is. What other colours does that so, And they actually come in um, red, and I think they actually have it in orange, if I'm not mistaken, but yeah. Oh, wow. So, so great. Yeah, some great. Variety. variety of, of dresses okay. and again like that it's not too puffed it's easy to move around in as well because again it's something to take into consideration and also it's not an itchy material either because sometimes with materials it can be quite itchy as we know yeah. so it's a really really comfortable piece to wear right yeah, and you see here with these too. great little straps at the back <laughs> <laughs> i know typical already it's seven months down the road and we're working on the pants already but anyway <laughs> and the earrings are stunning with them. and this is crystals and code of course we know them well for their fabulous jewelry collection and this is the black um, tree drop um, earring and again that little pearl detail just in the centre beautiful well. Jen thank you so That's much lovely. it looks stunning our next look is inspired by Eva Longoria yes and as Adam kindly told me this is the finale of the of the um, looks this morning I absolutely adored it this was a knockout it was a knockout yeah. but this piece now is, we are moving up price wise we are here, and listen, this, this is, is stunning it's blown the budget out of the water completely but yeah. you'd know it it's beautiful it's fabulous it's from Phoenix fee um, in Cork but it's a real statement dress it's basically the oh, short listen, dress we're showing it off in the telly. and we're showing it off in the telly and yeah. it really looks so well what about all of these beautiful um, sparkling pieces on both on the dress front and of course on the sleeve as well okay and so it has a lovely little slit there which isn't too high it's quite modest uh, yeah because those buttons they they're they're for ornamentation they're correct. not really there that's, right yeah. that's but correct. I love the sort of tux jacket style of mm. it isn't it gorgeous yeah. this would be fabulous for, for a black tie event it really is or indeed we have of course the VIP style awards coming up as well well, oh, there'll be it somebody wearing that and weekly I, scene I now. reckon definitely. <laughs> and it has a gorgeous cape drop on it, but it's just, it, it's expensive as we said, but it's a beautiful piece. It, it is. Listen, it's if there's someone out there that it's for, that's yes. the thing we are well aware that Absolutely. it is not for everybody. And what did you do everybody. jewellery wise with this? And for the jewellery then, we went with Dylan Oaks Jewellery. They're, they're here in Liffey Valley Shopping Centre in Dublin and Belfast, and of course online. But I'm loving this, and this is just a simple little um, amour chain for the love, which is actually, is actually the love heart chain, and we actually also have a matching bracelet as well. But again, like that, we just kept the jewellery very simple. Oh, very it simple. really deals oh very little. Alicia, yeah. listen to you. Does it so, shake, the, shake the hand? <laughs> and loving the, the shoulder structure on that as well. It's kind of a little bit of like I'm here moment, I think, as well. It is, it's gorgeous. She was yeah. thinking about it for the VIP Style Awards. I'm telling you. Should have kept, kept that one for we yourself. Can, we can always wear it again. It'll be OK. <laughs> and you're looking stunning in Lennon Courtney I this am indeed wearing an Irish designer, Lennon Courtney, from the Kilkenny store, yes. Stylist of the Year, Mandy Thank, Thank, Thank you so both so much. much. Thanks a million. Thank you. Does an amazing job all the time. Tommy, what's coming up after the break? Thank you very much, guys. Yes, Brian Lloyd is here to tell us what to watch this weekend from a TV series by the creators of Game of Thrones, which is? Uh, Three Body Problem. There you have it. And Lindsay Lohan's Irish Wish. Looking forward to hearing, <laughs> Looking forward to hearing. <laughs> what he thinks about that. That's after the break. <laughs> Welcome back from the most recent work from the creators of Game of Thrones to Lindsay Lohan's latest rom-com. Plenty to watch this week. Yes, and we've got the right man for it. Brian Lloyd from Entertainment.ie is here hey, to you. fill us in. Good Hi. morning to you, Brian. Great to have you with us. Let's start off with this uh, Three Body Problem, the new series on Netflix. What's it all about? Yeah, so this is from the creators of Game of Thrones, uh, David Benioff and D.B. Weiss. It's based on the famous novel of the same name. Essentially, what's going on is this group of scientists... Never from... heard of this novel. Never heard of it. No, no yeah, it was a big sci-fi book. It won, like, a lot... Like, there was, like, 
three different adaptations of it because it was originally a Chinese author that okay. did it. But anyways, so what's going on is a group of scientists uh, are basically trying to investigate this big wide range of mystery about why science is no longer basically following the laws of science anymore. And it turns out that it's actually aliens. Oh, of course dun, dun, it is. Dun. Yeah. Um, so these are the creators who did Lost. Yeah. Then they did no, Game, no, Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But some of them did Lost. Oh, some, some of them did, did Game of Thrones. Lost, and now yeah. they're doing this and they have really bad final series. Yeah. So they've managed to get this. OK, let's, let's take let's a look. Let's take a little look. Back in 1977, they detected a sequence. Called it the wow signal. What's it say? They are coming. Who are they? That's the question, right? Oh, we're okay. talking about that there. We're okay, it. this is... looks incredibly good. It gave me a right, you know, the yeah, movie very, very... of Arrival vibes. Yeah, yeah. It's similar to Arrival in the sense of like, it's really about not so much the aliens, so much as about how humanity responds to it, like, and the idea of, you know, what would we do? What would humanity do if it was confronted by this? Would it work together? Would it embrace the kind of the change of it and everything like that? It's very, very dense. Like if you've ever read the book, it's very, very dense. It's really kind of like hard science fiction. So they really kind of go into like, you know, the science behind radio signals and they bounce it off the sun and that amplifies and all that kind of jazz. But it worked in Hop Oppenheimer with quantum it physics. It did, didn't it? They, yeah, that's it. Really, like it was, yeah, it made it a, understandable. Exactly. But I think in this is that it kind of loses the run of itself because okay. on the one hand you have a very straightforward like historical drama because it goes back into like the 1960s and 70s okay. when this kind of be all began. Then it turns into a like almost like kind of like an action thriller in certain parts, and then it turns into like a very hard sci-fi. So it's kind of like trying okay, to do okay. ten things at once. It, it is good though, like the casting is brilliant. You saw there Benedict Liam Wong. Con yeah, Liam, Liam Cunningham is in there as well. Uh, Rosalind Chow, Isaac Gonzalez, John uh, Bradley from Game of Thrones is okay. in there. And as well. even top dogs in terms of directors as well. Yeah, like, Andrew amazing, Stanton. Yes, yeah, amazing Andrew actors. Stanton. Okay, what do you reckon? What do you it's worth it? a watch. Like yeah. it's definitely worth it. Like Netflix are putting a lot of money behind this. This was their most expensive series. It was like twenty million per episode, and you can see it. Ooh. So, oh, what? yeah. Okay, worth a, worth a watch. Just Try for it. That is alone, it on yeah. now? Uh, it's, it'll be on uh, next Thursday. Next Thursday. Okay, Drive Away Dolls. This is in the cinema. What's this about? Yeah, so this is uh, from Ethan Cohen, who was one half of the Cohen brothers, who did, you know, Big Lebowski, No Country for Old Men. This is his first film on his own, though. Why have yeah. they broken up? I don't know. Apparently, they just weren't getting on. Brothers okay. do that. Like, anyone who's gotcha. got a brother knows what that's like. You just want to smack the head in. Their own way. Sorry, Andrew. Um, <laughs> but um, in this one, what's going on is Margaret Qualley plays this uh, woman who's recently broke up with her girlfriend, decides to set off on a road trip to Tallahassee with her best mate. But the car that they're driving away, it turns out that it has something in the boot of it that they shouldn't have found. Okay, okay we've got a clip of it. Let's take a little look. What? Don't touch it. I saw this movie once where they come across this box. <gasps> and they open the box. The case. And it was like really, really bad. I just want to know what's going on. I bet it's locked. Okay, okay, so it's got like Pedro Pascal, Matt Damon, like it's got yeah, some no, it's got big yeah, it's got big, yeah, and it's comedy, is it? It is. It's like kind of screwball comedy in the way that like Raising Arizona was, or oh. the way the Big Lebowski. Yeah, that's it. But it's not as good as any of them. Oh, yeah, that's the problem. Like you can see that it's very slight. I mean, it turns out that the thing that they were transporting—I don't know if I can say this—but um, they were plastic penises. Okay. That's okay. That's we've, the whole thing. we've had them on the show dildos? before. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So they're dildos, and uh, it turns out that one of the—it's there's a whole story behind why the dildos, because it doesn't matter. 
the point I would say about it is I'm tripping up so much. Yes. It, it's not that it's not that funny. I don't think Margaret Qualley is actually that good as a comedic actor, and I don't really think her character is well developed. She's basically playing a kind of almost like a cartoon character. And oh. part, so you know. it's not as good as Dumb and Dumber what they have in there. No, yeah, exactly. Case. Yeah, like, that was comedy gold. <laughs> that was comedy. <laughs> okay, so what are you giving Drive Away? Uh, like two out of five. Oh, okay, yeah, not okay. great. Let's yeah. move on to something that you're saying is fantastic. Siobhan McSweeney stars in this. Yeah. This is Extraordinary Season 2. Season 2, yes. Yeah. So this is all on Disney+. Plus. All eight episodes are up on it. If you watch the first season of it, essentially what's going on is it's basically set in our time, except every single person in the world has superpowers. However, Moray Tyre's character uh, doesn't. Um, the powers are supposed to manifest when you're 18, but she's now 25 and it still hasn't <laughs> happened for her. I would say if you like the mighty Boosh, you would enjoy yeah. this because it has that kind of really out there comedy. And in fact, Julian Barat is in the second season of this. He basically plays like a therapist. From the mighty Boosh. From the mighty Boosh, yeah. And um, plays a therapist in this who's helping Murray Tyre's character to kind okay. of find her powers. It is a little bit screwy in parts. It can get a little bit sort of out there. Like, for example, her boyfriend in it is able to change into a cat and his name is Jizz Lord. I don't know if I can say that, but I've just said it now. So whatever I said. It's it's a, I don't know, like we were talking about dildos earlier. So, but th th that's his name. That's the kids, his name. The kids have gone to school. Right, it's OK. okay. Yeah, so uh, it's yeah. written by Emma Warren from uh, Northern Ireland, though, as from, well. Yeah, she's from County Fermanagh, yeah. And Mairead Tyres is from County... What? His, that's his name. What do you give it a... Like three out of five. Okay, Siobhan yeah. McSweeney oh, right, is okay. a treasure for yeah. the ages. And very finally, this is embargoed. You're not allowed to talk oh, about it, but I'm it's like this weekend. Irish Wish, Lindsay Lowen's comeback. Trafet in the garden, the garden, the garden. Patrick Sweet. Oh, the Irish. It was filmed in Ireland. It was filmed in Ireland, yeah. And they found like the oldest bus in the world to make it seem like, why did they do that? Because Leap Year did that as well. Leap Year did. We all have bad cars. If you can imagine, okay, imagine a big giant toilet. And I'm just flushing it. <laughs> well, I can't. I'm, I can't talk. Don't say that. We I have a trailer. Oh, Let's take we? a look. Oh, fast. Right. What brings you to Ireland? A wedding. No, oh, congratulations. Oh no, it's it's not mine. <laughs> it's my friends. I can't believe Paul and Emma are getting married. You balance me out, Madeline. We do make a great team. We do. Hi, Mom. I can't help but think that things would be different if I had told Paul how I felt. You're gonna have to start speaking up for yourself. It's too late now. I wish I was marrying Paul Kennedy. <sighs> what the? Oh! Paul? I'm so in, it's not even funny. <laughs> and they haven't made, like, Ed Spielers is in it. Yeah, yeah. He had to have an Irish accent in Outlander, the programme. Right, He's yeah. got an English accent in this. Thank it's God. Fine. Lindsay Lohan has her American accent. Yeah. Um, there the is... accents, I, I can't really talk about it, but like there are... They're there not are... annoying? No, they got Irish actors for it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, so yeah. That's, yeah. that's the a good accent, thing. The accents aren't the problem. Okay, and the bus, why do they, do why they not they know do we have the, the NCT? They have the NCT, like bus Aaron is not driving around. But Jane Seymour's in it as well. Does she live here, like, or what's she the story? She does Harry, doing that, yeah. that, that with Amy Huberman. Yeah, so I think right. she was here for a minute and they said, come here to me, we jump into the movie. There's a set down the road there, yeah? Okay, where can we see The Irish Wish? Just Irish. Irish wish. <laughs> oh, you can see it on Irish Netflix wish. from Friday. Okay. Uh, reviews are embargoed until 8 a.m. Okay. Friday morning. So, so you uh, have three body problem as Netflix, Irish Wish, Netflix, yeah. uh, Drive Away Dolls in the cinema are extraordinary season two on Disney Plus. Why is why are the reviews embargoed till 8 a.m. on Friday morning? You're gonna, he's well, not allowed to say what. If I say yeah. no, a, a red right. dot no, will just, appear on I'm my head. I'm just wondering why. Like, um, is that normal? No. 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 Uh, oh, Brian okay. Lloyd from Entertainment.ie, as always. Thank great you. to have you with us. Thank, Thank you very much. I'm going to see Dune 2 today. So. Oh, yeah. uh, now, that's all we have for time for today. Lots uh, more coming up tomorrow. It's been quite he's a day, hasn't it? One half has of been. the Cork Geo. <laughs> I'm Grand Mam uh, podcaster oh. PJ Kirby is going to be here. Uh, plus, it's the Coronation Street plot that everyone's talking about. We're going to be joined oh. by one of the teen actors involved oh, wow. in a very hard-hitting bullying storyline so on watch. the soap at the moment. And ahead of St. Patrick's Day, the folk band Kyol are treating us to a live performance. And Lindsay Lohan might be dropping in. <laughs> <as well. laughs> Seven on Ireland Day. Have a great Have a day. Bye-bye.